What's going on, guys? And welcome back to the channel. Special, special episode today, special video for you guys. We have Max, my man Max, in person. Um, we're going to give you guys some, some value. So what's up going on? Oh, man, just getting ready for Q4. Um, taking down, so we, we have this joke. We call my basement the back cave because that's where I operate out of. And um, getting it ready, getting a bunch of shelves, bins, trying to stay organized for the FBM season and uh, just ripping leads, scaling, you know? Yeah, so I, I want to give the viewers some some tactical, some technical stuff that they can walk away with. Before we get into anything like that, give the viewers kind of background in terms of who you are, how you started with Amazon, how you really got to the scale that you're at, and sort of some perspective in terms of the sort of operation that you're running. Yeah, so um, back in, I, I mean, it all starts in March. Um, I had a, I had a buddy, DB Flips, I think his name is on, on socials and whatnot. But uh, we went to college together. We were in the same frat and everything. And then he started doing Amazon um through miles and miles and garrett's coaching program and uh i was like dude what are you doing what's going on he kind of came over to my house we were living down the road at the time he puts me on and literally like that day i filed my llc and like for the next six weeks while i got like all the background stuff worked out like my business bank account got my credit cards got everything set up sourced for him for free um so he pretty much had a free va that he yeah. didn't even have to teach because i was teaching myself um and that's how I kind of learned how to source and like develop those skills. So that way, when I hit the ground, when I finally got everything in order and I could start selling, hit the ground running and um, ended up doing 40K in my first month. Uh, a lot of FBM, I think probably 75% FBM. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, sold my car right off the rip. Uh, but I, had, I had multiple cars, so I sold one of them and uh, used that capital to help me fund my amazon adventure so you started in march yeah. right april was your first like full month june june, june. Um, and so now we're in late october so what did you what are you gonna what are you planning to do in, in october just to give the viewers some perspective um so i took a little bit of a transition um in the beginning it was more so about like just scaling up doing a lot of revenue turning my money over faster so um it was more so velocity but i've taken a step back I'm doing a lot like my items are a little bit lower on the ASP side, mm -hmm. but my margins around 25%, on, which is on, nutty. Yeah. Um, I mean, I spent hours of product research, even when I was capital of like constrained product yeah. research, <laughs> sourcing on, on like stupid amounts. Um, and that's really what allowed me to bring my profit margin up because I started memorizing products that, you know, even though I might not have been able to buy at the time, I could still, you know, look up and like keep an eye on and like niche down in websites and figure out like how this website works, what's the patterns, what's going on with it. And like, I can now like on certain websites, I can predict when the next sale is going to be, what the next products that are going on sale, how much they're going to be off um, and really take advantage of all of that. So my profit is more so, is, is actually higher, but my revenue is the same. Yeah, which obviously all we care about is profit, anyways. Yeah. Um. And so, I mean, you were sh kind of showing me some things off camera before we before we start recording. Some cool things you're doing with the OA side. Um. And I think for the viewers' perspective, there's going to be really two big bottlenecks, right? The capital bottleneck, mm -hmm. which unfortunately is a, is a lot more difficult to sort of manage and overcome for a lot of people. Um. And the the sourcing thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, once you kind of can solve those two pieces individually, then you can see the growth and success that that everyone's kind of yearning. And so for that sourcing piece, right, what are some of the aspects that you feel um, allowed you to take so many leaps and, and, and be a significant growth in the beginning from a sourcing perspective? So um, are you familiar with like the term like chunking when you go to study or like yeah, psych yeah, psychology? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I, I take that aspect, like that psychological kind of aspect. I used to use it to study for tests, like cram study the night before for like my chem test or whatever in college. And um so I would take this chunking and I would niche down super, super far in specific products. Um, so let's say I wanted to learn about, you know, supplements or something. I wanted to sell beauty or something like that. I would niche down all the way down to a specific brand, like mm -hmm. specific type of product inside. Hey, quick commercial break. I appreciate you guys supporting and following the channel. If you are enjoying this particular video, which I'm assuming you are, if you're still watching it to this point, make sure you subscribe to the channel, scroll down, hit that subscribe button, helps me out, helps the channel out. Let's get back to the content. Out of that brand, and I would learn that in and out. And then you memorize the, that way, like you're, you're chunking this one little piece of a, of a big, of a big product market. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you have this piece 
and then you can add this piece and then you can add this piece and this piece and this piece. And next thing you know, you're putting all the pieces together and you have just like a long, you know, a, a, a large repertoire of products that you can source, uh, manual source, which is probably the most efficient form of sourcing. And, um, you know, increase your margins, learn the website super well, learn the discount codes. Um, and you're, you're, you're going to be cooking, man. You're so you got like, you get to start off by getting like very, very specific and niche with the sorts of products that you were after. Yeah. And then I work my way, work my way out. So I go from like, let's say, you know, I don't know, like product a mm -hmm. product group a, and this is like, this is, it's this much of the pie. Like say, let's say the pie is like this big, this much of the okay, pie. visuals going this here, much so. of the pie. I'm a visual guy. <laughs> This much of the pie, this much of the pie, this much of the pie until I work my way up. And now I'm like, I'm top yeah. tier in this, in this one specific brand. And, um, I'm on top of it. Like, like white on rice, man. There's, there's, yeah. there's nothing that really is going to be. And so continuing on that kind of path, right. For the, the beginner that's listening to this, are there specific types of products, maybe niches, maybe categories, for example, that you think are more beneficial to focus on rather than others? Um, I really think it comes down to how much capital you have. Mm -hmm. Um, I would start with the type of, of selling that you're going to do. Cause if you're capital constrained, right, you're going to do FBM right. RA and mm -hmm. you're going to flip that, that product fast. So you're going to be like going in and doing RA niche down to a specific section of the, you know, whatever, if you're doing grocery and you're at the grocery store, you know, specific section of the grocery store learn that thing inside and out then move to a different section of the grocery store when you know like all the products that are there and you can just walk in and go to that aisle and just like fill your cart and then you like check out like till you know it that well mm -hmm. then go to the next section then you learn that section now you have two sections of that grocery store and do that until you have that entire thing on lock and you're like in and out in an hour spending 10 bands on product or even building those relationships and then you can place like a large order through an owner or manager and come pick that up because you know the product so well you don't have to actually read keep a charts you know they're profitable yeah i mean i think one very efficient path to success for a lot of newer oa sellers specifically um is within like the clothing and shoes right because mm -hmm. something i talk about a bunch is is you know the money and the profits inside the adjacencies right you find and stumble across one maybe size or color of a specific skew mm -hmm. Well, now, ultimately, that can lead you to maybe three or four other sizes and colors, right? Okay. Or other different styles or something like that, right? So your catalog is going to really compound on itself pretty quickly. Whereas if you are sourcing maybe like uh, like tools or something, there's a lot of very unique single standalone ASINs that it's just harder to really start to compound and, and build, your, build your catalog that way. Yeah. So I think for OA, right, for the, the viewer listening mm -hmm. to this, there's just a lot of beginning opportunity within like Nike, Adidas, under armor some of like the name brands uh shoes and clothing brands yeah. uh just because again a a lot of oa sellers are naturally going to be hanging out on a lot of these listings and b they a lot of them you can start to really stack them and, and grow your catalog pretty well pretty quick yeah and i think the variations too that you're mm -hmm. talking about yeah. like so the one thing that you'll hear a lot and i heard this a lot when i got started because i'm fairly new yeah to like the whole oa scene and everything um I, i've heard stay away from shoes Stay away from clothing and shoes because their return rates are high. All right. So you get a product that's returned, right? What happens when they get it returned? All right. You relist it. Yeah. Right. So it's still getting sold. You're still going to make your profit. And your profit margin, like your profit that you're making on a product is probably going to be higher on a pair of shoes. So that's going to eat up um, that that maybe like $2 loss that you might take on the refund administration fee. Um, so, and I think especially with colorways and shoes yeah like if you want to niche down that far colorways is really where it's at for for shoes like if you can find a colorway that's hard to find at a good price you're going to make a ton of you're going to make a ton of cash on that so as kind of you know looking back on your growth the past four or five six months what are some of the biggest areas of struggle especially starting out that you kind of uh, ran into while sourcing was it you're not knowing necessarily what sorts of products to look into. Was it not knowing how to go about looking for these products? Kind of uh, what were some of the biggest bottlenecks and issues that you found within sourcing and getting going? Um, I think when you first start, like it is, it takes hours to be able to find maybe even like your first lead. Right. And once you break into that first lead, 
and then you get your second lead and like it builds but getting that first and second lead right off the bat was probably the hardest thing for me to do um i probably spent like four hours like looking mm-hmm. through because i didn't really know what i was doing so like i was i knew um pat taught me about reverse sourcing i was reverse sourcing people um and more so in the supplements area and i like i didn't know you know what websites were good what websites were right. bad i didn't know like, but then you get experience as yep. you as you do just volume yeah exactly and that's what that's what really took it from like being super hard to super easy and i think everybody struggles with that in the beginning is like all right like i'm not finding anything and i see it all the time on twitter i'm not yeah. finding anything and then boom it's like you know you find one you find two you find three you find four and then it's like you're finding like seven a day instead of like one every hour to, to like five hours yeah i mean i think ultimately what it comes down to is, is really how quickly you can disqualify these products yeah. right it's there's not necessarily a, a magic sauce with sourcing it's just that i can look through a hundred bad products say no to them really quickly and get to that hundred first one again really quickly that's the that's that's the key yeah and i think people don't it's how fast you can disqualify those bad mm-hmm. products um and i mean having a fast computer helps too oh i mean big time <laughs> big time big time and and also being able to acknowledge the immediate signs for a no it's the increasing offer count it's amazon owning a, a buy box 100 percent of the time even though that's not always a complete disqualifier but it's it's picking up on a lot of the red flags that are a telltale sign that you need to move on and not wasting more time right because as a beginner seller right? It takes time to get through these products, right? And so it may go, take you five hours to go through 20 products, which is fine. But that's why it's just such a long and, and kind of cumbersome process, right? Because you don't necessarily know where you're looking. You don't know what you're looking at necessarily. But as you gain experience, you find a site that works, you find a brand that works, you could double down into that. Maybe you find six, seven sellers that you know are smart, that you know are selling good products, and you can learn from them as they add products. Right. So you get more strategic, you get more pointed with your sourcing, which ultimately, and as you've seen, right, in your first five, six months, it just makes you so much more money because you have some of these experiences, some of these nuances and knowledges that you can, that you can build on. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, it's like, I think another thing that you should like, just kind of throw in here is crazy colorways too on like, yeah. And when you're talking about clothing and stuff, like when you see something that's super far fetched, don't even bother because I guarantee you nine times out of 10, that thing does not move. Like you 9.99 times out of 10, that thing does not move. Yeah. So um, really being able to get in there and kind of know like, all right, this is, this color is good. This color is good. This color is good. And this color is good. And then when you finally get to like learn what products, what mm-hmm. styles sell, then you can start applying those filters on manual sourcing and that's what makes manual sourcing go so much faster is because like you can apply these filters on a website and then cancel out all the no's and you're only looking at the yeses yep and so being that we're recording this what is it late late (laughs) um october what are some of the things that are on your mind as we are really starting to get into the pick of q4 with halloween coming and going with approaching thanksgiving and december and, and christmas and all these sorts of things what are you thinking about and how are you preparing uh, to really try and maximize and squeeze everything you can out of the next couple of months? Um, well, so like, I like to think in the long term. Um, back in September, uh, I think a lot of the people that, I mean, are on Twitter or whatever, they probably know that uh, I, I'm in my MBA program. So I paid my MBA tuition, but I paid it on my personal card. And Amex references your personal credit. So um, I paid it right away because I realized that the mistake that I made right away, I was like, wait, I just paid my MBA tuition on my personal card. It's going to like increase my credit usage, going to make my credit score go down right after I just did this monster month. So like the past two months, I've been building my credit back up and I'm finally back up, like back up to where I want to be. But um, that was my main focus is like just building that spend as high as I can get it. Because I know when Black Friday comes, all the product research I've been doing, all of the time that I've spent just looking at products, looking at what's a high velocity item, um, I like going into these sales, I will be able to, you know, look exactly at this product page, exactly on this source link and be able to run through it faster than anybody else. So like what I'm doing is I'm going through every single site, making a list of products that I want to look mm-hmm. at. And then I'm going to be going just, I'm not even going to be sourcing the sites. I'm going to be sourcing my own list of products and the source links that I want to buy from that I think are going to be profitable just based off the product research I've done. And the cool thing about that is every product market is going to kind of go through cycles, right? Yeah. Product will be good. People will find it. Mm-hmm. 
price will drop, people will fall off, price goes back up, people will find it. You know, it's kind of that like cyclical sine cosine curve. If you uh, if you're into math out there, um, that we see and the repetition and the kind of the cadence that a lot of these products continue to fall. Right, mm-hmm. we see it with a lot of the seasonal products. There, where Halloween products and Thanksgiving products increase in uh, increase in velocity, increase in price around the same sorts of time frames. Right, so you even documenting all of that work is going to make your life maybe easier. Not only this couple months, but in June and in December again. Right, because you'll continue to reap the benefits if you stay organized, if you document, have all the references, have all the links that you can continue to reference back to. Yeah. And I mean, one thing that when you were when you were just talking about now that came to my mind is like you're talking about the curves on the offer counts and stuff. I feel like a lot of people always look at the pink lines, right? On the keep it charts. They're always like, oh, this is the most important thing. Buy box is the most important mm-hmm. thing, whatever. It's not. It's not the most important, important like piece of information that you're gonna get from a keep it chart. The most important thing is the offer count by far. Because I mean, you know if a product's profitable but you can predict what's going to happen based off of the past and based off of what's going on, what portion of the cycle is this product in and you can then uh, kind of execute in the future. So I think that in my personal opinion, the offer count tells you everything you need to know about a product. Like I will look at the buy box itself. You could probably erase the buy box chart and I will look at the offer count and tell you if I'm going to buy it because that's, most important piece of information on and keep up well especially with within the oa space i just think there's so much value in, in putting a lot more emphasis on on velocity right mm-hmm. and, and obviously with respect to offer count and and and, and speed of that product at which it sells rather than buy box rather than the price because with oa you could always and a lot of times find that extra margin somewhere whether it be buying a disc a gift card somewhere whether it be looking for an extra coupon code whether it be shipping it to a sales tax free state, right? Those are kind of how we can sort of manufacture margins, so to speak, which if a product is close, right, you can maybe message a sales rep, a customer rep and ask them if they have any welcome emails or things like that, mm-hmm. right? So there's things you can do to seek out that extra 10%, 5%, 15% discount if it's close, yeah. right? Whereas yeah. with the velocity, if a product doesn't move, it doesn't move, yeah. right? If the product market's saturated, and there's not enough velocity, not enough volume to withstand that saturation, then there's nothing you can do, right? Mm-hmm. And so just with respect to qualifying products that we were talking about a little bit earlier, if you really put an emphasis on qualifying based on the velocity of a product market with respect to its competition level, you're going to make uh, create a lot of efficiencies with, with, within your business, right? Not wasting time on a product that doesn't move uh, rather than vice versa, if that makes sense. Yeah, a hundred. Speed is. We literally said it. You need yeah. to move with speed. Speed is the most important thing in this business, and you'll learn that right off the bat. Number one is speed. Number two is organization. If you're organized, you'll move faster. You'll spend less less time on admin. You'll be able to source more. If you move with speed, you'll go through these products. You'll know what you're buying. Know what you're not buying. You'll be able to sell through velocity wise faster, compound your money faster, and therefore be able to buy in bigger bulk, which will end up making you more money. So like. I mean, speed is number one on the priority list 100% of the time. And everything that we do, right, it all leads to more speed. Mm-hmm. So you start out, you're prepping your own products, you're finding yeah. your own leads, you're doing everything, you're doing your own admin. All right, well, then the first thing you've probably like, what I got was a prep center. So now I'm not prepping my own products to go FBA, which saved me a bunch of time, allowed me to move faster and mm-hmm. order more. So now I'm getting a v- we're in the middle of getting a VA. So now I have a VA, so I don't have to source all of my products. So now I'm going to be moving faster and learning new products faster because I have more time to do product research. And it just all compounds. And the number one thing that we're trying to focus on emphasizing in our in our kind of operations on day-to-day basis is how fast can I move? What's going to make me move faster? And you know, how many times can I turn over my money this month, this quarter, or this year? Right, right. And as we start to wrap up here, talk about kind of the value that you gained from having people that you can kind of relate to and, and talk this stuff through. Obviously, it's cool that we're doing this in person, right? We yeah. met through, obviously, Miles, who's connected a bunch of us. But um, kind of talk us through what you've benefited from, experienced, and gotten uh, kind of seen within like your little space. Yeah, I mean, I, I work together with a gr- great group of guys, um, Nick, Pete, uh, Deke, Steven, uh, the other Max as well. We were, we have prep talk together and stuff. And I mean, even the guys that I originally started out with, like Dre, 
uh, Mason, John, just to add into that and Cole, but like getting started, I worked with um, one group and then um, we kind of like built together, learned together everything. And then like, kind of just like moved to working with Steven and everybody. And the best thing that came out of that was always having somebody that relates to what you're doing and the decisions you're making. Right. So like, well, I'm 20, I'm, I'm 23. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really like everybody my age is going out on the weekends. Everybody right. my age is going on vacations. They're working their nine to five. They're making their, their cash. And they're like, they're washing their hands. Like on the weekends, they're going out to the football games, you know, they're doing all this fun stuff and that's great. And it's really hard to not go with them sometimes, right. but like having a group to like hang out and like be on zoom and source products with makes saying like, no, to that stuff so much easier because like, you're not doing it alone. And we like to honestly, like we all have different strategies of sourcing. Right. So like for me, I, I said, I niche down to that product really specific and I work my way out. Like Steven's really good at RA. He likes to find loops and stuff. And um, Pete is like dialed into like different aspects of um, social media and stuff like that. And he's helping us out a lot out with prep talk and stuff. And Max is helping train our VA right now. And, you know, we all have our own like special thing that we're really good at. And we use that to our advantage. So that way it frees up time and allows us to learn things and build our own businesses faster. So like mm -hmm. it's a, it's a mutual beneficial relationship. Yeah. So and you see the compounding returns because of it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like I could, I could pump out freaking some, a lead that somebody's going to spend five, grab 500 yeah. to a thousand units on. And we all grab like 500 to a thousand units on. And then that saved them couple hours of sourcing which allowed us to you know build our podcast a little more work on that uh, work on training our VAs a little more so um, it all it all helps out in the end and like vice versa you know it's it's a give and take yeah and the synergy I mean that you that you guys have established what yeah. in like the couple months that you guys have all known each other is, is pretty cool to see um, obviously there's something I benefited from with Miles and Danny and, and Jake years ago uh, so it's cool to see like the next generation of sellers that are kind of replicating the process that works, the process that we have, you know, the pay, the, the path that we kind of paved. Um, yeah. We're just trying to be like you, like Uncle Garrett <laughs> out here, man. We're just trying to be like Uncle Garrett. <laughs> Uncle, we got Uncle Flips, Uncle Garrett. That's we got, it. You got Uncle Wi-Fi. <laughs> but um, oh, yeah, man, uh, thanks for chopping it up. Obviously, I hope we've left the viewers with some good tactical, technical stuff that you guys can replicate. Um Put you all over social media. Where can the viewers find you? Um, so you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Fulfilled by Max. Um, definitely more active on Twitter, but I'm gonna be getting into like Instagram a little more just because you know why not? Why not show more of the the pictures and stuff that's going on and the day to day operations. Um, and then the podcast. Oh yeah, and we have the podcast, Prep Talk Podcast. That's tough. Probably have we'll probably have Garrett come on sooner or later, whenever he's feeling up to, it, whenever he wants to leave. Yeah. Uh, leave uh the hometown right now. <laughs> Maybe yeah. after Q four. Yeah, busy, busy <laughs> times. But yeah, thanks for having. Uh, thanks Sorry. for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, leave, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you in the next one.